<laughs> hey guys, Cody Adair here. I'm with Jason Merkel, and we have the brand new E Flight P51 Mustang on the table, 1.5 meters. Yes. And most importantly, that I think the biggest feature here is, is we have our incorporated our smart technology in this airplane. So as you guys saw there at the beginning of this video, we do have our low voltage alarm going off because we plugged a battery in here that was obviously not, not ready to go. It's yes. not ready to go. So one of the just many cool features that we have in this new airplane. Yeah, I think a lot of people are still not sure what they get with a smart battery. And I want to show this screen because this can save your airplane. This one simple feature of smart, the transmitter is getting an alert via the smart ESC and the AR637T receiver that's in here. That battery we plugged in is probably like 20% charged, if that. And so if you ever get mixed up at the flying field and you don't pick a battery that's charged more than say, and you can change the default. The default's 4.1 volts per cell, which would be roughly like an 85 or 90% charged battery. If you plug in a battery less than that, you're gonna get this warning. You have to hit clear to get past it. And this is again going to prevent you from potentially taking off with a battery that is not fully charged. That is the one thing that Smart offers that you don't get unless you're out there physically checking your battery, keeping track of your batteries. And I think that's a great feature. So I'll go ahead and clear that out. And then we'll talk more about the smart features here in a minute, but let's talk about the airplane itself right. because this is really exciting uh, for a lot of reasons. This is what we consider our mightiest E-Flight Mustang yet. It's our largest E-Flight Mustang. It's our most scale. It is our most uh, uh, capable, highest performance Mustang yet. It has great top speed, excellent vertical performance, phenomenal flight times, and you won't be able to see it all in the video here. Uh, there's a number of videos that we've already published. Uh, we've also worked with some, uh, some guys that you may know uh, Pilot Ryan and the RC Geek, Mr. Chris Wolf. They've already published some videos, some unboxing assembly videos, even some shakedown flights. Be sure to check those out so you guys can see some of the details up close. Uh, they discuss some of the features of the airplane, but on top of that, also show you some of those um, you know, scale details, the panel right. lines, the guns, uh, shock absorbing struts, drop tanks. There's a lot going on in this airplane that we couldn't do in a smaller scale. So we've had a 1.2 meter Mustang for many years now, and it's very popular because it flies phenomenal. It looks great uh, and on top of that it's pretty darn scale but this takes it to a whole nother level which is why we call this an extra scale airplane and we've right. done that uh, for a few a few months now we started with the f4 ducted fan 80 millimeter edf that we had we also then carried it over to the f18 80 millimeter edf and then also the su30 twin 70 millimeter edf those are all extra scale airplanes right this is our first extra scale propeller driven airplane because that takes the scale detail and the scale features, functional features, to a whole nother level. Right, so some people might compare this to the FMS one model that we do carry here at Horizon. Yeah. In comparison, why is this one just amazing? What is so different? So it's all new guys. Uh, we've seen a couple of people make this comment that this is just an old airplane from you know some other manufacturer that we just took and modified and made it our own and that's not true. This started up as a ground up design we chose the size, we chose the feature set, we chose the amount of scale detail, uh, we went through it with a fine tooth comb. It's been in development for a number of years now. This is not a modified version of anything. It's not modified tooling from anything else. It was a ground up design. It's ground up tooling. It's a ground up all new model. So we chose this size specifically for a reason. Some people for years have been asking us to make a Carbon Z P51. First and foremost, let me start by saying Carbon Z is not a size of airplane. It's not a class of airplane. Most people identify it now with our Carbon Z Cessna 150 or our Carbon Z Cub SS, which are giant scale aircraft, foamies or the Carbon Z T28. But Carbon Z was originally in smaller airplanes. It was just a form and style of construction. Right. It's basically hollow EPO foam or what we called Z foam at the time, which is EPO foam. And then it had carbon fiber and wood supports internal in the structure. This airplane has that. Right. A lot of our E-Flight airplanes have that. Our EC-1500 right. has that. Uh, some of our smaller Warbirds have that. A lot of our EDFs have that. So we just don't use that nomenclature, that branding, that right. that, that classification of just carbon Z right. anymore. A lot, and again, people, a lot of people just kind of use that terminology for larger airplanes. Yes, it's not the case. But it's just not, to, it's just the, not the case. So yeah. I'll say that first, but then I'll say the reason that we chose this size, 1.5 meter versus say the two meter of the carbon Z T28 is a whole lot of things. First and foremost, we wanted it to be large enough to put scale detail into, but we also didn't want it to be so large that it was cumbersome to store and transport. Right. And then on top of that, we wanted it to have fighter-like performance with a 6S battery. We didn't want it to be, you know, 
good power, okay power, or pretty good power, but not a lot of flight time because it's so big, you have to be on the throttle a lot. So, you know, the Carbon Z T28 is a great flying airplane, but I don't think anybody would say it flies like a fighter. Right. It has good power, but it doesn't have the speed or the vertical performance that a lot of people want in the world today. So we sized this and developed the power system to give us really great top speed. In level flight, uh, top speed is about 80 miles per hour, which may not sound fast, but for a model this size, it is fast. It's also faster than scale speed. Sure. So that's a big deal. Basically it has unlimited vertical with pretty much all the batteries that we recommend. That's better performance than the Carbon ZT28. But then on top of that, the icing on the cake, if you have typical throttle management and you fly it the way a lot of us do, your flight times are gonna be five to 10, maybe even more than 10 minutes if you use a 7,000 milliamp, 8,000 milliamp battery. So if we had made this larger, it would have cost more it would have been more cumbersome to store and transport, and you wouldn't have had the performance that we're getting with this 6S power system now. And so all of those are important details. That's why this is not bigger. Also, that's why we came out with this being larger than the 1.2. It doesn't sound like a lot, and we didn't bring a 1.2 meter model to show you the difference. It's not just a little bit bigger. It's, it's not 20% bigger. bigger. This thing's a whole lot bigger right. than the 1.2 meter. Maybe you can lift up the tail and right. kind of show guys uh, just the overall kind of kind of size here. So the 1.2 meter is important to note that that's just referring to the wingspan. When we make a larger mm -hmm. airplanes like this, you also get longer fuselage, guys. So yes. There's a lot of things here that you can't really just classify as a, as a really close skill because it's not. It's a lot bigger than a lot of people think. Yep, exactly. So uh, a lot of um, thought goes into the size of model that we come up with. We recently released, uh, for example, the E-Flight Twin Otter, and we chose that 1.2 meter size for that so it would be smaller, easier to transport, and so you right. could fly it in smaller spaces. Now, we wanted to have a bigger, more powerful Mustang. We've, had, we've wanted that for a number of years. A lot of people have been asking for that for years. Uh, and I will say, yes, we hear you guys. Uh, people say, oh, another Mustang. You guys are just always making Mustangs. Well, we'll be honest. Last year, we came out with a lot of not Mustangs. We had an E-Flight P39, 1.2 right. meter. We had a Hangar 9 Fokker 30, Hangar 9 KI-43 Oscar. We came out with the F-18, the F-4, uh, the SU-30. All of these models are different than a P-51, sure. different than an F-16, different than your run-of-the-mill, typical, you know, Horizon hobby popular airplane. That said, Mustangs still outsell all of right. them. It's and very, yeah, as I say, they do outsell, and not only that, but we've incorporated, you know, smart, smart technology in right. this airplane, guys, so it's not just a core release from E-Flight, it's also a core release from, from Spectrum as yep. well, I mean, with the AR637T and the Avion 100 amp speed controller, I mean, it's, it is a core release P51, guys, but you're also getting a lot more yeah. features than what you normally would. So it's not just another P51, we've got smart, we've got more performance, we've got more scale detail, we've got a larger size. We also put a trim scheme on it that, of course, trim schemes and looks are always subjective. But so far, the response to this trim scheme that we chose has been overwhelmingly positive. People like that it's a little different, uh, it's blue, it's somewhat bright with the yellow nose, it's easy to see, easy to orient in the air. Right. For those that are not terribly familiar with this particular scheme, this is not a World War II scheme. Uh, this is the, well, I take that back. The overall shape of the lines and the edges and so on and so forth, that is from what they used in World War right. II. However, this particular trim scheme was usually where the blue is, was usually olive drab uh, back in World War II. Sure. This particular model, what we've done is we've simulated the Lou Forth that's out there out uh, in the real world now. It's a restored airplane and the owner decided to paint it blue. And I think it looks great. I think it looks awesome. So I've personally always liked blue with yellow nose Mustangs. Sure. Uh, my very first low wing airplane almost 30 years ago was a P-51 Mustang, 40 size, a little smaller than this. Uh, weighed a lot more than this though, and it didn't fly anywhere near as awesome as this does. And it had a very similar trim scheme, and I always loved it. Ever since that day, I've always wanted to have a larger, higher performance, more scale P-51 that had this scheme on it. And right. so, yeah, we're very excited. Again, it is a scale scheme. Sure. It's just maybe not a World War II scale scheme, but that said, it just shows up great in the air. It, it, it is unique. And I, um, at the same time, I think it's just something that it's people were on it, uh, they're kind of surprised by it. Right. A little so unexpected. I think we should jump into some of the actual cool things that we've yeah. done from a design standpoint. So Jason, from the assembly standpoint, mm -hmm. what kind of time frames we're looking at to assemble? What's the cool little perks with this new airplane? So that's one of my favorite features of a lot of our aircraft. This airplane goes together with no glue. No glue is required. There's only one thing you might have to glue if you so choose, and that's the antenna here. In order to keep it in the box safely, um, we had went ahead and left that off. There's a few other things that are in the original version of the manual that say you need to glue on a few other scale details. We actually had those glued on at the factory so you didn't have to do it. So that's the only one potential glue joint. The airframe goes together with screws. The stab, horizontal stab, goes on with three screws. The wing goes on with four screws. The outer panels snap into place, and we'll show you guys that here in a minute. And then there's eight screws to hold the prop blades onto the spinner hub. 
and there's two two uh, screws per blade. So basically it's a total of 16 screws, but really it's eight screws to put the airframe together. I had this pulled out of the box, I programmed my transmitter, I assembled it per the manual, I centered all my control services, I double checked all my throws and directions, and I was ready to fly in 40 minutes. And so for That's some awesome. people, they could do it even faster. That's some people awesome. may take a little more time. Basically, we say it can be assembled in less time than it takes to charge a battery at, say, 1C. Right. That's so, actually really cool. Yeah, you can't beat that. No. It, and <laughs> I, 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 I've built a lot of airplanes. I've scratch built airplanes. I've done kits, everything. And these days, I really enjoy taking a plane out of the box, building it, going to the field. Yep. And all in the same morning, right. all in the, the, I think, do it the night before and go take it the next day, it's great. I think convenience is important when we yes. come into the design of these models, guys. I mean, a lot of people with the larger stuff, for example, the Carvin ZT28, wonderful model, but you have to kind of plan your days accordingly on when you want to go out to fly. Yeah. With these airplanes, when we do things like design with the removable wingtips, which Jason will show you here shortly, mm -hmm. um, it, we did the measurements here so we could actually Think of the guy in mind that has a smaller sedan. This will fit in the trunk of those vehicles. So yeah. we think of that. So you guys, you know, don't have to plan your days out accordingly. If you just have the fluke to go fly, you can just do so. Yeah. Uh, we make that that simple. So we have the out of box assembly is very easy and simple. And then the potential at the field assembly, if needed, is simple. Now this airplane is sized such that uh, some people will be able to transport it all together in one piece. But for those that may not be able to, we do have the wing panels set up so they plug right in. They're, it's a three-piece wing, by the way, guys. So we've got two outer panels. They split right here outside of the flaps. And then on top of that, the center section houses the retractable landing gear. So when you pull the wingtips off, the center section stays on. The wheels are already deployed, so it makes it kind of easy to set places. You don't have to worry about trying to set it on the scoop with the gear Getting retracted. The yep. Yes, exactly. So there, there's a lot of benefit to that. So I'm going to pull the panel off here and show you guys. That's one of the wing panels off right there. I can go ahead and pull the other side off and then show you guys how small the remaining structure is. It's really not bad at all. And if you guys watch our video, you may note that in there we show putting it, or actually pulling it out of the trunk of a car. And so having it broken down like this, it's pretty darn easy to put it in a back seat of a car or in the trunk of a car. Right. So you can transport it this way, you can store it this way. You know, you can see the center section of the wing is not a whole lot more span than say the horizontal stab. Right. So that makes it not an overall large package. Again, very convenient that the landing gear stays with the center section. Right. And Nothing to point it. out, we have our hands-free connection system in here. Yes. So it is an updated, uh, an updated iteration of that. Yes. Um, so it's super simple, guys. As Jason just showed you, it just snips into place. And what's really cool is, is you got these two little components here that actually lock down the outer panel section here. Those are totally replaceable parts. So yes. over time, if you wear them down or if you have an accident, you crash or you, you, know, hit a, you drag a wing tip, those parts are all replaceable, so yes. super easy to, to get going there. Not only the receiver that's in the, the wing itself, we have uh, separate pieces in there for uh, receiving the pins that are in the outer panel that snap into place. These pins are also replaceable. That said, there's a pretty darn tight fit. We worked really hard to get this to go in securely, to fit solid, and then over time to not wear out quickly. But again, if you happen to break one, you can buy them separately. It is our uh, version two design of the hands-free connection system to make it uh, seat better, more reliable, longer term connections. Uh, that works great all around. So right. all you have to do is carry these panels with you. And when you're ready at the field, you just slide that in. And there is a, an anti-rotation uh, pin peg square sure. here. You slide that into place, make sure all that's lined up, and then you just press. That's it. Yeah, there's no confusion on whether or not you think you got it in, guys. You Watch will know. Watch this, guys. It even, clicks hard. Even Cody can put this on. Oh, man. That's, a, that's, that's nice of you to think like that, Jason. You know, I do have some muscle deficiency here and some, some tough times. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah you got it. You got it. <laughs> Oof, I thought I, I thought I spoke too soon on that. <laughs> so that is one thing we did. Not only is it easy to assemble out of the box, it's also easy to assemble at the field and to break down for transport and storage if needed. And I really like that it's a three-piece wing. I think that is the way to do it when it comes to a lot of these tail draggers with wing-mounted landing gear. So it's hard to beat that. Uh, and then on top of that, guys, when you have the setup for uh, the radio, for example, you can follow our instruction manual. Of course, you can go to the Spectrum website and download that. Uh, onto an SD card and load it into your radio, but it's a very simple radio setup. There's sure. not a whole lot to this. It's not a super complex airplane. It is a six channel aircraft minimum. So if you have the plug and play version, you need at least a six channel transmitter. If you have the bind and fly basic version, if you choose to use safe select, it's optional use, you don't have to, right. you would want a seventh channel so you can actuate safe select on and off using that separate channel. Right. So uh, of course you've got throttle, we've got ailerons, elevator rudder, we have functional flaps, and of course we have retractable landing gear. It is important, I wanna talk about that for just one second, guys. 
A lot of you are coming from like the 1.2 meter Mustang that doesn't have a scale tail retract. We went all the way with this and gave you yes. guys the functional scale tail retract. So um, it is located, you know, more towards the center section of fuselage to give you that scale realism. Mm -hmm. Scale location. Very cool stuff. It's got their, their retractable door. Awesome stuff. This is not just your typical P51 coming from us, guys. This is a really just all ground up new design, lots of features, yep. really cool stuff. So we went all out on having the tail wheel in the scale location to have a retractable tail wheel. And then on top of that, it also has doors. Right. And then the main gear, we also of course have what we kind of consider the strut covers. You guys can see these kind of hanging down over the struts here, but we also have sequenced inner gear doors. Right. It's really phenomenal. So maybe you can hold the airplane up and, yep. I, and, and hold the belly to the screen and we could show guys the actuation on the retracts here. Give me one second. My muscle deficiency is kicking in right now. <laughs> All right, so you guys will see again the retractable tail wheel here with the doors. You also will see that the sequenced inner doors will open to allow the retracts to go in, and then once they go in, it will close again. Pretty darn cool. We also slowed it down to be a little bit more scale like. Right. Now watch those inner gear doors come in and closed. Ooh. Boom, done. And then we'll open it. And watch those inner gear doors, guys. They're gonna close back up because they're sequenced. There you go. I'll take it. Yes, we went above <laughs> and beyond on that because we wanted this to be the most scale Mustang that we've had in E-Flight yet. Um, to give you all the scale features that guys have hoped for, but we can't necessarily put them in smaller models. Either a, co a cost issue, a complication issue, a weight issue, a space issue, all those considerations. So by using this size of airplane, we were able to get that for you. So I'm really excited to have those. Oh I, I haven't had a P51 with a retractable tail wheel in many years. Yep. The vast majority of manufacturers have left that off and you can modify some airplanes to add it. And I gotta say guys, it's just kind of nice having that extra level of, of detail. Oh, right. by the way, so that does have its own servo. It is a steerable tail wheel. Yep. So you guys will see, of course you got rudder control and we do have the steerable tail wheel. Now yep. really quick, I, I wanna point this out. This is a tail dragger, tail wheel is in the scale location. It is a warbird. It has relatively wide stance landing gear. So P51s are not the worst ground handling warbirds or the worst ground handling tail draggers out there, but there's something that I've learned over the years about tail draggers and warbirds in particular. Number one, you should always spend time, whether it's a tail dragger or a tricycle gear airplane, to trim your nose wheel or your tail wheel for the, to, to make it taxi as straight as possible so your workload is not increased on the ground. Right. The way I do that is I might do a taxi test before my first flight and adjust it that way. But once you do that, you then fly and you may trim your rudder a little bit, which may, in this case, of course, we have a separate servo for the rudder and a separate servo for this, the tail, um, uh, tail wheel, but if you, affect, if you use the trim for the rudder, it's going to affect both of those. Right. So once I trimmed my rudder and flight took a couple of clicks, I had to go back to my tail wheel, readjust it, and there's an easy connector in there, there's an access panel, you can pop that panel off, you adjust that easy connector, and I centered my tail wheel, I did a couple more taxi tests to make sure that my plane was tracking as straight as possible. That not only helped me on my takeoffs, also helped me on my landings, and of right. course it just makes it easier to taxi back. I don't have to work the rudder constantly. Sure. On top of that, there's something else that I wanna point out. If you have, your main gear and you're looking at it, in this case it's kind of probably hard for you guys to see on the video, but you obviously want to make sure that your wheels, your main wheels, are not towed outward. You want to have them either straight on or towed somewhat inward. Right. Otherwise what will happen is the airplane will kind of you know, dart each direction uh, if you have any toe out in particular and that's problematic. Also you need to make sure that your wheels are spinning free. So these particular very large wheels, very scale with diamond tread, awesome. Yep. We have ball bearings in them. Look at how easy that spins. If that's hanging up at all on one side or both sides, it'll also make ground handling difficult. So all of these little things you should watch out for, not just on this airplane, all airplanes kind of in general. Spend the time to check and make sure your wheels are properly aligned, make sure that they're rolling clean, clean and free, and then adjust your tail wheel and or your nose wheel to make sure that it's tracking as straight as possible. That Absolutely. will make you more successful on, on takeoffs and landings in particular. Absolutely. So. so do you want to jump in on some of the smart features? What is so cool? Yes. What is smart? Well, what real is... quick, before we go inside, just you guys may already see it. You got the navigation light yep. out there on the tip. We yep. did show you guys the flaps, of course. Oh, it's hard to see it there. Maybe lift up the tail for them. They can see that. So it's got the functional, tail, uh, functional flaps. And you guys can see a lot of travel on those if you want. It's up to you. And then the drop tanks are removable. Yep. So they just kind of slide in and out of place. It's similar to what we have on a lot of our other uh, EDFs and Warbirds. So you've got some tabs in here that go into interlocking holes. Right. So you slide those into place if you so choose. And of course they're optional use. They do slow the airplane down just a hair. Um, 
but it is something that you can consider using or not. We do have a very large diameter four blade prop. Some people have said, oh, that prop doesn't look that big. It's a pretty darn big prop, guys. It's 15 right. and a half by 11. It is a very large prop. You can feel the torque of that prop. If we had put an even larger prop on it, you would have had even more torque effect to deal with, which would have made it less enjoyable to fly. Right. You would have had to deal with potential rolling and yawing when you punch the throttle. Right. You would have had different trim at full throttle and low throttle or mid, mid throttle, a big hassle. So we put what we believe is a good combination of diameter, pitch to get good performance without having a lot of negative torque effect. So I think that's kind of important to mention. And again, it is a 6S power system. It does have a smart ESC. Right. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop this hatch off and I'm gonna plug in a fully charged battery so that way you guys can see the smart data. I'm also going to show you the tray. Ah, so the transmitter is alerting us that our battery voltage is low because we unplugged it. Right. So uh, we've got a variety of batteries that work in this model. Everything from a 6S3200 all the way up to a 7000. We've got the 3200 here, which a lot of guys use in, say, 70 millimeter EDFs. The 4000, of course, which is very popular for 70 and 80 millimeter EDFs the ever popular 6S5000 that almost everybody's got one of these or a couple right. of these. And then you can fit all the way up to a 6S7000. There is a removable tray, battery tray inside. Yep, super handy. Yeah, and you can set up this as you, as you so choose. So for example, with a 7000 milliamp battery, I'd put it further back on the tray to help make sure that it's not too nose heavy. If I use a lighter battery like the 3200, I just put it further forward on the tray. And that way I can adjust my CG that way. Uh, with the 5000, you pretty much put it in the middle of the tray you strap it in place, and then you can slide this into the fuselage. And the reason that we use this battery tray is because the battery needs to be somewhat further forward than where the battery hatch is. Right. And this makes it a lot easier to get it into place. See, as, you know, I don't have the smallest hands in the world, but it would be really hard for me to get my hands down inside right. there. So you put it on the tray, you put it down in the fuselage here, and there's a little rail system that locks this into place. And what's really exciting about this is when you snap it into place, it locks, but then on top of that, you'll notice that we put a wedge here in the hatch that actually helps capture the battery. So even if for whatever reason it did slip out, you do have it secured inside the model. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug in the battery, put the hatch on. I think it's really cool guys, just to kind of talk about the tray there again. I think that aids for CG. A lot of times when you're going with different batteries and stuff, I mean, CG is still important. We definitely recommend that you guys check that. But the battery tray aids in that. It's a single positioning tray and your battery just goes right on there. It's super simple. Yeah, it's pretty easy to get it in the same spot because you put it on the tray where you're used to putting it in, slide it in, it locks it. it. Right the, in. the tray always goes in the same place, which is right. kind of nice. So I've got my Spectrum Smart Battery plugged in. Now I want to point out really quick that even without a smart battery, you will get telemetry data. Right. You don't get as much data as you get with a smart battery. First, I'm going to show you guys the flight log. This is actually typical standard. of our standard telemetry sure. information. So this has your fades, your holds, not terribly different than what people have seen before. But now we're going to start getting into some different data that we didn't have before, a smart ESC and a smart right. receiver. And then also I'll point out that you do have to have a couple of things. The plug and play version of the airplane comes with the Spectrum Avion 100 amp smart ESC. Right. You have to still have a compatible Spectrum receiver. Right to get that smart data out. Right. So we do have a handful of those receivers, guys. Yes. We will link those in the description so you can see those. Yeah, so there's the uh, four channel, six channel. Of course, the 637T T, or the TA model channel. that's in here. Two six channels. Exactly. Yep. So by getting the, by having that receiver, you then get the data to the transmitter. You also have to update your transmitter right. to the latest firmware. You may not have the version 2.04, I believe, or 2.05, yeah. right. which gets you to this data. And so I have the 637T because this is a bind and fly basic version that does come with that receiver. We did update this transmitter literally this morning. Right. So we have this data. You guys are first seeing on this menu, you'll see this same data with a standard non-smart LiPo battery. Right. You've got the, the minimum voltage that the uh, receiver and ESC have seen. First, when we plugged in the battery, the voltage is a little on the low side, and then it spiked up to the 24.8, which is almost fully charged. Right. You can see the temperature on the low side was 79. It's now warmed up to about 72. Um, the receiver voltage is up now at six volts. And then we'll scroll to the next screen. That's when it starts to get real interesting. Yes, now this screen, a lot of the data here also shows up if you have a standard non-smart LiPo battery. So I'm gonna go ahead and run to the motor just briefly. He's got a good grip on the airplane. We're just gonna bump it up so you guys can see the RPMs. Check that out. So that is the RPM of the motor. I'm gonna turn throttle cut back on, throttle hold back on. So you guys can see the voltage minimum, 
the maximum voltage, the minimum RPM, which of course was zero. Right. And now we bumped it up to about a thousand RPM to show you that. You can right. see the FET temperatures. That's basically kind of the ESC temperature, so to sure. speak. Even the BEC has its own temperature because of course it's working independent of the FETs and of the ESC. Right. Uh, BEC current, it's not measuring that at the moment. And you guys can see the BEC volts. It's, it's roughly a six volt BEC. Right. And when you load it up a little bit, it goes a little lower. And then we've got another screen here now this is where you get the benefit of a smart lipo battery so you guys will see that kind of battery graph battery bar there now that's not necessarily a perfect depiction if you're familiar with your phone battery voltage right. indicator you know the line looks this and that and sometimes the percentage doesn't line up to what the right. lines do um, but that said you can see the battery is basically almost fully charged in this case. It was, right. we kind of ran it up a little bit. So I think this, this menu in particular is one that a lot of users will use because not yeah. only do you get a, visu a visual representation of what your battery level is currently at, but it also shows you your RPM guys. It also shows you your motor amperage. You get, you get all, it shows you your throttle percentage based off your stick positioning. So a uh, lot of cool stuff here. It shows your motor percentage and output. Um, awesome stuff in this menu. So this is yes. a menu that I particularly will be using quite a bit. Yeah, so this is the menu I think a lot of people have up on the screen right. while they're flying. Now, if you have a transmitter that has voice, you can actually allow it or set it to give you a report every few seconds when you press, for example, the momentary button. Uh, if you don't have, in this case, this is a DX80 transmitter and a 6E transmitter don't have voice. So you potentially would have to look down to see that. That said, you can also set up the minimum voltage alerts uh, with a tone. Right. So it'll alert you, it'll beep at you, just like your timer would, so on and so forth. Right. Uh, but this is great data to have. And so with a smart battery, you get the bar graph and the approximate, you know, kind of capacity remaining. With a regular battery, you wouldn't see the bar graph. And then this next screen here is all exclusive to smart. So what that means, guys, by exclusive to smart, what he means there is you have to have a smart capable receiver, mm -hmm. you have to have a Avion ESC, and you have to have a Spectrum smart battery. Right. So you have to have the smart ecosystem in order to get the rest of this data that you're gonna see here on the screen. Yeah, so what we're seeing there is the temperature of the battery. That's very interesting. That comes from the smart chip that's in the battery itself. Uh, the approximate capacity remaining, again, we kind of ran this up a little bit so it wasn't quite fully charged. Uh, it'll show you the current, if we were running it net right now, the current going out of the battery, which, you know, there might be a slight difference between what the battery shows and the ESC shows. We see the imbalance of the cells. By the way, guys, 18 millivolts is like nothing. And this particular battery has five cycles on it. Uh, it's a relatively new battery. Then I'm gonna go to the next screen which is the individual cell voltages. Now, the accuracy on this screen, you know, if we went down one more digit, these numbers would probably be even closer. Sure. So you're seeing the individual cell voltages. What's interesting about this is, if you have a single cell that falls low in voltage, it'll alert you. Right, and you can set That's the cool. balance level too. So like you, if you want it to be within 0.1 away, or if you want it to be 0.3 yes. away, you can set that. So it's a really cool feature there. Another menu that I'll use you know, quite excessively in my opinion, um, just because I wanna make sure my battery's good when I fly. Yep. I wanna make sure I know what the cells are before you're removing the battery, plugging it into a checker. You don't have to do that anymore. Just, yep. You got it right there on your radio, super, super handy and so convenient. Really great data. I will show you guys a little bit deeper. We're gonna show you the telemetry menu, which allows you to set and custom Optimize, the voltage ranges. You have auto config, you can hit that. That'll kind of default everything to what it's originally set up for. Right. But you're gonna to wanna to fine tune this depending on the battery that you're using, depending on what your preferences are. By the way, guys, don't just click once. If you click once and scroll, you're gonna change which uh, particular data you're showing here. If you click a second time, I'm gonna go into the menu now for a smart battery. What you're seeing there, that is the minimum and maximum voltage that will trip an alert when you first plug in a battery. So you guys might have noticed there at the very beginning of the video, and if you didn't see that, I'll plug it in here in a minute and show you again. I will plug in a battery that's not charged to 4.1 volts per cell, and it will give me an alert that says your battery is not charged to fly. Right. So if your battery is overcharged for any reason, you will also get an indicator. That probably will almost never happen for most right. people. And in this case, the imbalance max is set to 200 millivolts. So if you have a slighter, higher imbalance in your cells, if it's over 200 millivolts or at 200 millivolts, you'll get an alert that tells you you probably shouldn't fly that particular battery. So right. I'll go back. You can see we've got the ESC telemetry menu. Again, double click to get into there. I went ahead and set this to 19.8 volts for a 6S battery. Uh, that's about 3.2 volts per cell. Right. Now every battery performs a little different when it's colder outside, your lower voltage 
uh, well, you'll probably see lower voltage overall, so you might need to set this a little bit lower. Uh, and you can also set what are the max amps that the ESC can get to before it alerts you. You can set the max FET temperature, the pull count of the motor to get the correct RPM. Really cool data. And the temperature menu, double click, gets you into there. You can see the minimum if you want to have an alert, if you want to have a maximum for the alert. That's really cool. Here you can set the volts. So right. you can choose 6S LiPo and it'll default to 18 volts. Right, it is important to note here guys, see the alarm shows as inhibited. Yes. Um, you guys have to turn some of these features on. So when you bind to this airplane um, with all the smart ecosystem mm -hmm. stuff, there are some, you know, some default sensors and data that you will get. But it is important that if you want to take full advantage of all the features, you're going to want to come in here, turn some of these alarms on, yes. customize it to meet your needs. Exactly. So in this case, it's a, an 80 e or a 6E transmitter. You don't have voice as an right. option. It's either inhibit or tone. Right. If you have a transmitter that has voice, you'll see that act, that actuation or that, that option as well. Uh, so we'll go back here. And then you can see there's other empty slots because you can have additional telemetry data as you so choose. Right. You can also potentially plug in our GPS speed sensor sure. as a separate add-on if you want to get speed. Uh, and then you guys can see flight log and also the receiver voltage there. So we'll go back to the main screen. And I want to show, for those that might have missed the beginning of the video, I'm going to unplug this almost fully charged battery. And I'm just going to really quickly plug in a battery that's not fully charged so you guys can see that alert. And you can see I unplugged the battery and it's alerting you that something's not right. Now I'm gonna plug in a not fully charged battery. And this alert that you're about to see here is going to save a lot of people from taking off with an undercharged battery and crashing right on takeoff or a minute into your flight. Again, I plugged in a battery that's not fully charged. When you guys saw that menu where it showed 4.1 volts per cell, if any battery is under that, when I plug it in, I'm gonna get this alert. Right. This is going to save models. It's a huge benefit of smart. Right. Huge benefit if of smart. If you guys can have it, why not use it, is the way I look at it. If it's gonna become standard in a lot of our stuff, it's it's just an awesome little tool to have. Yes, phenomenal. Can't can't beat that, guys. So, um, yep, there you go. So that's the, a lot of the smart features are, are gonna be new to people, and I think it's gonna take some people time to get used to them. But once they do, I think everybody's gonna want that. I think so too, and I think another feature that I'd like to point out here, guys, is that the timer, I, I keep coming back to this. I mm -hmm. think the timer is, is a very handy menu. There's a lot of reasons that you can use it. But one of the main reasons that, and, and most people use it, including myself, is because we didn't have smart. Right. Um, normally on EDFs, we usually say, you know, maybe three to eight minutes, depending on your flying style and also depending on the aircraft. Um, but with this case, and, and you would set your timer for a nice in-between. And when yeah. that goes off, you're saying, okay, I want to land before potentially my battery dies. Right. Well, now you get actual live data. I mean, if, if you guys, if we're telling you that you can fly between three and five minutes and you're landing at a safe timer setting, now you can fly to the exact battery specifications, the exact battery right. voltage level. So you can squeeze in an extra minute and a half. Yeah. I mean, that's hugely impactful in my opinion. I always want to fly longer in situations where I'm enjoying the experience. Yeah. And now I can do that. I have a battery, I have the smart system. I can actually land when my battery is actually low. I think that's just, that's awesome. That yeah, cool and some, you know, sometimes you fly hard. Yeah. Maybe you're, you're flying with some buddies, you guys are racing, so you're using more full throttle, or maybe you're up cruising around, you're just flying around real slow. Uh, if you're using less current, if you have your timer sent to four minutes either way, you may land with 50% remaining, you may land with 5% remaining, you may run your battery out. Right. But with smart telemetry, real-time telemetry data, we now have the ability to program that to a voltage that works best for our battery. Let's say we want to always end at 20%, no problem. You can program that. Don't even worry about setting a timer potentially. Just right. take off, fly to your low voltage battery alarm, and land. Right, and you maybe squeeze in a few extra minutes that you wouldn't yes. normally have with, with your timer setting. Yes. So cool, cool stuff And there, also guys. on top of that, again, we mentioned if you have a bad cell or if your voltage, your battery drops really abruptly for some reason, whether it's a bad connection or, or something else, you're gonna get those alerts. And you may get those alerts on your transmitter before you even notice something wrong at your airplane. Right. And again, I think that's gonna help save a lot of airplanes. And so, yes, that does cost a little more money, but at the same time, this is a not inexpensive model. Yeah. I love the idea of protecting my high value models with smart technology. Sure. It adds a lot of safety net to the model that I didn't have before, or I could get, but I had to have a bunch of sensors and everything before. I don't need all of that now. So again, guys, this is available in a Binafly basic version, which comes with, of course, all the 
the servos. I believe there's nine servos in here total. They're different sizes. Um, some, are, some are larger, some are smaller, depending on where they're located in the model. Uh, of course, we've got the 6S compatible power system installed with an outrunner motor. We have the Spectrum AVN 100 amp Smart ESC. That is standard in the Binafly Basic version. Uh, and then on top of that, we also have the AR637 TA receiver. Right. which is our new version basically of the 637. It's like the next generation, I'm sorry, of the 636, which gives you now full range telemetry. Right. Before the 636 gave you like short range telemetry. Right. You basically yeah. had to be like within, I don't know, 100 feet. Right, and there's also work. some really cool features with the AR637T guys. So for example, we now, if you have a generation two transmitter, so the newer edition transmitters, you will have a forward program menu that you can actually adjust the gyro straight from your transmitter. That's really cool. You yeah. don't have to have any programs or anything like that. So again, the newest stuff that Spectrum is releasing, um, a lot of that is going to be incorporated into the eFlight brand. So you're going to have a, a lot more capability for, you know, I would say a similar price. So we're super excited for the product that's coming. Yes, yeah, so you can uh, fine tune. Fine on the tune. fly, Easily. basically. Yep. Something we couldn't do before. Right, if you want it off, you want it on. Super simple. It is important to mention that this aircraft does have safe select on it. Um, so yes, in the want, Binafly version. If you want to have that, the Binafly version does have safe select. Um, and we've actually, um, I wouldn't say that we've gone away from the bind plug, but we've actually incorporated an actual bind button. So yes. there's no, I don't know about you guys, but I go to the field and every time I need a bind plug, I don't have one. I've got a thousand <laughs> bind a thousand plugs. Of them. Every time I need one, I don't have one. So yes. we thought about that. We're thinking of you guys, um, you know, and we put an actual button on the receiver. Um, so in case you guys did forget your bind plug, you no longer need it. Now, yes. of course, there is a, uh, an adapter on there, an extension, so to speak, in the bind port. If you want to use a traditional bind plug, you can, not required. Yeah, there are models where you might install or that we might install the 637 and you're not able to access the button easily. And so we will still have the bind port available for that. And again, in this case, we have an extension in there if you wanted, if it makes it easier for you to get to. The right. button's not terribly difficult to get to on this, but we went ahead and added that as a convenience feature. The 637T, of course, has that full range telemetry. It has AS3X. It has optional use safe select programmed in it in the bind and fly. And real quick, I want to point this out because I keep running into a lot of people who are taking a 636 receiver out of a bind and fly airplane and putting it in another airplane you can do that but only if you reprogram that receiver right. you cannot just take a receiver that's programmed for the orientation that it's in in that model for the gains in that model for the safe select directions in that model and right. stick it in another model reverse your servos at your transmitter and oh it's all good it's going to work no right. it's going to give you opposite inputs it's going to crash your airplane this receiver is the same way you can reprogram this you can use this in another model but you have to change it with the programmer right you can't just take this out stick it in another mustang take it out stick it in another anything You've got to change the orientations. You have to potentially change the gains to make it work properly. And now some guys have said, oh, I've done it. I flipped the receiver upside down and twisted it at 90 degrees or 180 degrees and it worked just fine. Yeah, that's possible, but you have to make sure all your directions are correct. So we don't advise, we don't recommend that. One thing we do a little differently with the 637 now is we have a little label on the side. So when you get it in a Binafly airplane, let's say you ever take it out of this airplane, it has a label on the side with the item number of the model that it came programmed with. Right. I think it's also hugely impactful to note that now that we have the forward program menu and you're able to adjust the gains directly from your transmitter, yeah. um, going forward, it might be a little less cumbersome or less difficult to do this just because you can turn the gyro off with your transmitter yeah. and then once the gyro is inactive then you could put it in another airplane and then set it up with your transmitter in the right. new airplane so you no longer have to take it out reflash it or adjust the settings like you do in the AR636 it's kind of a way in the past with the new setup you can just do it directly from your transmitter super simple super easy you just do have to do it but again this model is already programmed the Binafly basic version for the uh, this P51 in particular I gotta say guys this thing I've flown a ton of Mustangs this Mustang is so locked in not only because of AS3X, but in part because of the aerodynamics of the model, um, the airfoil that we chose, the power system we've got. But what really blew me away was how slow it can fly. It can fly fast, 80 miles per hour, level flight, uh, you know, probably pushing 100 miles per hour in certain dives. But then on top of that, I didn't check the low speed performance, what the actual miles per hour was. But if you guys check out, we've got a couple videos that we've posted on our Horizon Hobby Products channel on YouTube. Uh, be sure to check that out. You can watch the Flight Talk video and you can see a, slow, a couple slides slow passes that I do where it literally looks like the plane is going to fly out of the sky. Right. That is how stable, locked in, good performing this is in a wide range, all right. the way from slow to fast, everything in between. Uh, you can land it pretty darn slow, especially with the flaps down. Uh, that said, it does take a little bit of practice uh, landing a tail drag or warbird like this. You know, some guys like to three point land. I found that with this model, I prefer to do kind of the on the wheel landings, on sure. the main wheel landings and kind of fly the tail to the ground and then to turn out of that right. rather than trying to three point it and that maybe bouncing or maybe, you know, not getting good tail authority and spinning around, uh, ground looping on, on landing. So watch out for those things. Check out those videos. Though. 
make sure you check out also Pilot Ryan, his YouTube channel, Pilot Ryan Media, and also the RC Geek, Mr. Chris Wolf. They also have made videos for this model, flying the model, putting it together, going over some of the details, the features, Spectrum Smart Technology. We'll have additional videos, right, with yep. the uh, Smart Technology? Yeah, we have another video that should uh, come live shortly after you guys are seeing this video that kind of goes more in depth um, with the ESC programming on this yeah. particular airplane and AV on ESCs in general. Um, so if you guys have questions on that, um, just stay tuned. That video will, will be out shortly. Um, we will link those in the description for you guys. Yes, and so again, we had the Binafly Basic version, which has the 637 receiver in it and this Spectrum Smart ESC. The PMP version also comes with a Smart ESC as well. The PMP has everything the same as the Binafly Basic version, just no receiver. So you can put any receiver that you want. Right. But in order to get the benefit of the Spectrum Smart ESC, you do have to have one of the Smart compatible receivers. So again, we'll link those in the description below. Uh, by the way, guys, you might be seeing this video later on YouTube. We are right now live on Facebook. That's why Cody's got his computer. He's watching the comments, looking for questions that people may have. Uh, and then we will again upload this to YouTube later on. So don't be alarmed if you see him looking at his computer. He's just making sure that nobody's uh, <laughs> asking questions that we haven't addressed. But have you seen anything that we haven't addressed? Um, no, we actually, uh, we have our another brand manager here from the Spectrum team, Tom ah. Cogswell. He's doing a really good job monitoring the, the, the chat here, guys. So we do appreciate that. Thank you, Tom. We'll give him a shout out. Yes. Um, Daryl does want to know, um, he wants to see the battery compartment. We could try to show you that. It's going to be a little hard to show you the battery compartment here, Jason, if you ah, want to well, look this could, up. Yeah. So real quick, guys, the hatch does have a very positive latch in the back, and then it's got a tongue in the front. You can pop that open, and you will see there's a lot of room inside the airplane. But where the battery goes is actually kind of under the hood there, so to speak. Right. And again, as we showed earlier in the video, if you're just not seeing this for the first time, we do have a removable battery tray in there. Um, so the battery tray, as it slides in, it clicks into place. So the battery is, what, depending on what battery you use, um, you may have to adjust for CG with a, with a, like nose weight or, or something yes. along those lines because the battery tray is a fixed location. Um, but super simple, super easy to use, guys. Down inside of there, there's there's quite a bit of room, uh, plenty of room for all the batteries that we recommend, which again right. is everywhere from a 6S3200 up to a 6S7000. I think the vast majority of people are going to use a 5000, uh, which is what we primarily recommend. And again, I think it's going to give people the best balance of power, performance, and flight time. Right. With a 6S5000, I was getting anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes, depending on how hard I flew it. A couple right. of flights, I just flew it around mostly full throttle. And I landed about four and a half to five minutes in and I had, you know, 20, 30% remaining, which is pretty good. Right. But then there were flights where I did a lot more throttle management and I landed at eight minutes and I still had 30% left, right. which is why setting a timer is not the best way to do it. Not to, anymore. To optimize not your anymore. kind of flight duration per charge, right. you need smart technology so you can rely upon those low voltage alarms, those capacity alarms, rather than hoping that you didn't use too much capacity by flying too hard or leaving capacity on the table because you flew a little bit softer. Right. So like. As Jason said, you know, back in the day in control line days when, you know, Jason what was doing that stuff, you know, we didn't have smart, so we've come a long way since then. Lots of cool stuff, battery reporting, all kinds of cool stuff. So Jason's I, Jason's super excited about this. He comes from way back in the, in the, uh, okay. in the old age I, I there. I probably so. did learn to fly before he was born. Yeah, that's, that's probably, probably true. true. That's, that's, that's a good educated guess. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> oh, actually, we know for a fact it's true. That, that we do. It's sad, but true. We well, do. not really that well, sad. The gray but... shows a little bit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> all right, all right. No, you're right, you're right. But it is true. We have come so far, guys. Yeah. My second, well, it was my third airplane, because unfortunately my dad, sorry dad, you did crash our first airplane, so we had another airplane then. My first low-wing airplane was a 40-sized P-51, a little smaller than this, weighed a couple pounds more than this, and I flew with a KMB-40. This thing, it had to fly full throttle the whole time, and even then it wasn't that exciting. Very hard to land. This yeah. thing looks better than that airplane by a long shot, flies many, many times better than that. And on top of that, I'll have smart technology to give me that telemetry data. It's, it's a whole new world, guys. We're in 2020. Spectrum is leading the innovation side of things, not just with transmitters. Obviously, the iX12, iX20 are a step above and beyond a lot of other transmitters, but even the current transmitters with the software updates, now with the complete smart ecosystem from the transmitter to the receiver to the ESC, and on top of that, the battery, it really can't be any better than this. Right. I it's would agree hard to 100%. Say. I would agree 100%. Lots of cool stuff coming. Jason's just as excited as we are. You know, he has a lot of past stuff he's been working with there, but lots of cool stuff coming from, from the Spectrum. Yeah, and then something I want to point out real quick, because I know a couple guys asked, do you have to have a smart battery to work with a smart ESC? You do not. If you plug in a regular battery, it works just fine. There is an IC5 connector on the ESC. It does have the third wire, but an IC, or, I'm sorry, an EC5, EC5 connector yeah. plugs right in. It just doesn't utilize that third wire right. so you don't get smart data. So again, some of the screens we showed earlier, you will get some data, like full pack voltage, but you won't get individual cell voltage. You won't get battery 
uh, temperature. Um, but that said, if you do pick up a smart battery to realize the full benefit of the smart ecosystem, you can also charge this with a regular charger. You do not have to have a smart charger, not at all. You can charge it on a regular charger, plug in your balance connector, just use it like normal. Battery. Uh, but if you have a smart charger, it's awesome because when you plug a smart battery in, it knows how many cells it has. It knows what's current rate to set it at. You can set it to charge at 1C, 2C, 1.5C, whatever your preference is. You right. plug it in, hit start, and walk away. Right. So it's that, it's that foolproof that, well, I shouldn't say it's foolproof. You shouldn't walk away completely. You should still monitor your batteries while they charge, but it's a lot easier to do that. Also, smart chargers work with regular batteries. Right. So you don't have to buy a smart charger, a smart battery, a smart airplane to get all the benefits. You can buy a little bit at a time, but that said, you get a lot more benefits from smart batteries. These batteries guys are great. You probably heard me say this in numerous videos. The batteries themselves, I've been using LiPo batteries for almost 20 years. These are some of the best cells you can buy. They perform phenomenal. They're lightweight, good power, great cycle life, uh, all the great things that you'd expect from a LiPo. And then on top of that, with the smart circuitry, we have individual cell monitoring. It will basically self-balance the battery for you. But then on top of that, my very favorite feature of all, auto discharge, being able to self-discharge to storage voltage. I knew it was coming. So I set these batteries to 48 hours. You can set it all the way from one hour to 240 hours using either our smart battery checker or a smart charger. Once you set that, if I charge this on Friday night and I go flying Saturday, don't use it, go flying Sunday, don't use it. By that 48 hour mark on Sunday night, this thing starts to self discharge at a low rate yep. down to storage voltage, right. which is extremely important. I don't think guys still realize that leaving your LiPo battery fully charged for more than, for any time at all really, but especially more than a couple days, especially longer than a couple weeks in a hot car, in a hot garage is going to kill your battery fast. That's why a lot of batteries puff. That's why a lot of batteries have a cell dropout because you left it fully charged. The smart battery will solve that problem for you. I will say I am 100% guilty of that. I will charge my packs the week before and sometimes I forget that I'm going oh. out and they do sit for a while. Of course they sit in a, a safety container. Of yes, course, but, yes. Uh, I, I do forget. So this is a huge feature. This is one of the reasons why, as Jason mentioned, I'm getting into the batteries. Um, don't think of that as a sales pitch, guys. If you, if you're, if you don't have smart batteries yet, I encourage you to give it a shot. They're, yes. they're very cool batteries. And with the stuff that we're gonna be implementing in e-flight aircraft going on in the future, why not get them? Because they're gonna be, you're gonna get all kinds of cool features. There's really just, really, the, the pros outweigh the cons, in my opinion, yep. and going forward. And the price of the 30C battery is very competitive, guys. We have 50C and the 100C series as well for guys that need a little bit more performance. Uh, but that said, you can't beat the overall value. Um, and then, of course, the integration with the smart ecosystem right. is phenomenal. So real quick, we can summarize a couple things. This is, again, the brand new E-Flight. All new, guys. This is not a modification of an existing design or anything like that. This is an all new design, ground up. E-Flight P51D Mustang, 1.5 meter span. Even though it doesn't sound a lot bigger than 1.2, it is. It is. Uh, and then on longer top of that, too, guys. yeah, much longer. If you kind of bigger all around, yeah. the whole fuselage the is wider. The 1.2 like stops roughly like right around here, guys. Yes. So there's a lot more length of the fuselage too. It is a lot bigger in person. Yes, a lot bigger in person. It is available in a Binafly basic version, which is 499.99 in the U.S. So fi about $500 U.S. A plug-and-play version is also available without the 637T receiver for $40 less. It's $459.99 in the U.S. So about $460. Both of those versions will be available at the same time. We're going to start shipping this uh, about a week from you guys seeing this live on Facebook. So in the U.S., it's going to ship out a little later um, in other countries. But you can pre-order it now. I know a couple guys are asking, they want to see the bottom, so we're going to show you guys that. You see the invasion stripes. Now, we did show earlier, we had the battery plugged in. We went ahead and retracted the gear. You guys out were able to see these uh, sequenced gear doors in operation. So you can see there, those do open and close when you retract and, of course, uh, then deploy the landing gear. So it's pretty darn cool, all that sequenced for you. We do have a retractable tail wheel as well, and it is a steerable tail wheel with an independent servo. We have the removable drop tanks. And of course, we got the really great invasion stripes here. And I got to tell you, it's easy to tell top from bottom with this I agree, airplane. 100%. No problem at all. Now, you said Bonafide Basic, so it means it doesn't come with a battery. So you do have yes. to buy a battery separately right now to get this, or do we have anything going on? Yeah, so what we, well, we do, we will have something. Be sure to check out our page for that. We don't want to talk about that too much because it's only a limited time offer. Um, but if you're looking for your first smart battery, take a look, quick look. There's a special incentive if you do a pre order on a version with a battery. So be, be sure to look for that. Uh, but then on top of that, uh, it will be available again at the same time, about a 
week from you guys seeing this uh, on Facebook, uh, but make sure you pre-order now. Pre-order on horizonhobby.com, at your favorite online retail, your favorite local hobby shop. Uh, I'm really excited about this because I think it's, even though we're kind of in the middle of winter right now, this is the kind of airplane that I would go, wow, I gotta buy this. And I, even if it's cold, I'm gonna go fly this thing. Right. Because it's so cool, it's so unique. Uh, I know it's a, another Mustang, but it's not just another Mustang, It's a guys. smart Mustang, guys, come smart. on. We, we kind of in her, internally, we refer to it as our mightiest and smartest Mustang yet. Yeah. And it really truly is that. Now I know we've sold some larger Mustangs over the years in the Hangar 9 brand. Of course they're wood, uh, partial composite maybe in some cases. Uh, but that said, this is our largest E-Flight Mustang yet. It's probably, I would say overall, one of the best hands down flying P-51s there's ever been in the market, period. Uh, and then on top of that, I think it's just the right combination of all the scale detail flight performance, technology, and also, my favorite part, super easy to put together, super easy to transport, super easy to store. I would can't agree, that. 100%, guys. It yeah. is an awesome product. I just We can't stress it enough, lots of cool features here. So it is not just your typical Mustang, guys. Yep, be sure to check out our videos, check out the videos for our Pilot Ryan Media, check out RC, the RC Geek, uh, Mr. Chris Wolf's videos as well, yep. a lot of good stuff there. Also check out our videos on our product page and keep watching for additional videos on smart technology that Cody and Tom did together. It's really good information there. Uh, we're very, very excited about that. Also, if you do need to update your transmitter for smart technology, uh, Tom did another great video on showing you how to download that to an SD card how to load it into your transmitter. So if you're not familiar with that, trust me, it's super easy to do. I just did it recently. It's it's, it's seconds, guys. It's yeah. seconds of your time. No problem at all. So. All right, guys, we are going to yes. wrap this up. So we are monitoring your comments. Please, if you have any other questions, go ahead and leave them in the comments. We'll be monitoring after this video. We appreciate you guys being here. Be sure to like, subscribe, and if, we, if you could, please share this video. We yes. would like this to get out there to as many people as possible. So thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you.